From KPU News in Austin, you're watching Texas This Week with Ashley Goodo. Good Sunday morning. Suspended Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton was in court this week for the years old securities fraud charges against him. More on that in just a minute, but first, let's get to the three things you need to know in Texas politics. A body was found stuck in the buoys Texas installed in the Rio Grande on Wednesday. Mexican officials found a second body in another area near the buoys. In a statement, the Mexican government came down on Texas, but a spokesperson for Governor Greg Abbott defended the buoys, saying preliminary information shows the person drowned before they were near the barrier and DPS monitors the barriers for people trying to cross. Meanwhile, the DOJ is suing Governor Abbott in an attempt to make Texas remove the buoys. Just one day after the new interim president of Texas A&M promised transparency, the university released hundreds of pages of letters, emails and texts that were part of an internal review. Pharmacy professor Dr. Joy Alonzo was temporarily suspended in March after being accused of making negative comments about Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick during a lecture at UT Medical School in Galveston. One student, the daughter of Land Commissioner Don Buckingham, said Alonzo blamed Patrick for fentanyl deaths. This week, Buckingham claimed Alonzo said, quote, your lieutenant governor says those kids deserve to die, end quote. Alonzo denies that and was cleared of any wrongdoing. The documents show after her suspension was lifted, the head of A&M's Pharmacy Practice Department wrote Alonzo a letter asking her to be thoughtful in speaking engagements. In regards to the botched hiring of Kathleen McElroy, the university was in the process of hiring the UT professor and celebrated journalist, but changed the deal, rescinding tenure and other benefits after some A&M regents wanted to halt the process. In a text from June, one wrote, quote, I thought the purpose of us starting a journalism department was to get a high-quality Aggie journalist with conservative values into the market. McElroy turned down the deal. The fallout led to the resignation of A&M President Kathy Banks, and the university approved a $1 million settlement with McElroy. Attorneys for suspended Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton want 19 of the 20 articles of impeachment against him dismissed. They filed a motion Monday arguing the articles violate the state's prior term doctrine. The Texas Constitution states an official can't be impeached for actions that happened before they were elected. Paxton's attorney says the allegations in all but one of the articles happened before the most recent election. It would take a two-thirds vote of the Senate to dismiss an article of impeachment. The trial starts September 5th. After years of legal delays, fights about paying attorneys, motions to change venues and appeals, the criminal case against suspended Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton is moving forward, sort of. He appeared in a Houston courtroom on Thursday. KBU senior reporter Tony Plohetsky was there. He joined me to talk about what happened and what's next. You know, first I want you to set the scene for us. What was it like in the courtroom? Tell us about Paxton. It was the opposite of how, frankly, I thought it was going to go, that there would be this grand entrance by Ken Paxton. He would go through courthouse security, just like I did and just like every other member of the public would do. And so as journalists were lining up outside the hall, we were all waiting with cameras trained on the elevators on the 17th floor for Ken Paxton to get off that elevator and walk down the hall and into the courtroom. That's not what happened. Instead, we were allowed into the courtroom. The courtroom was open. We all filed in. And Ken Paxton was already there sitting on the front row with his back to the crowd. And so unlike what I thought was going to happen, that's not what happened. Ken Paxton was allowed to come in and exit through a private courthouse entrance. What about his demeanor? Were you able to tell anything? I know it was hard because his back was to you right. the whole time, but were you able to see anything about, about his demeanor? Frankly, no. You know, mm -hmm. generally you're able to look at someone's facial expressions as all of this is going on, but because his back was to the crowd, we didn't see that. The only real glimpse of anything we saw from Ken Paxton is at the end of the proceeding, he got up, he walked toward, again, that private exit, and he seemed to kind of pat the bailiff of the courtroom on the back, and that was essentially it. He remained seated, of course, the whole time as both parties went before the judge. They stood at the bench for maybe about 15 minutes, but again, Ken Paxton really not making himself very visible during this proceeding. What exactly happened? What, what was this proceeding about and what happened? 
So keep in mind, this case has now been on the books for eight years. And so the effort for this hearing is a new judge is assigned to the case. The venue, there has been a lot of back and forth over the past several years about whether this case would be tried in Harris County where it was moved or whether it would go back to Collin County, which is Paxton country, his home territory. Once it was determined by the state's highest criminal court, the Court of Criminal Appeals, that the case would in fact stay in Harris County, it was assigned to a new judge, a new Democratic judge, and she's a Democrat, who took the bench fairly recently. And so it was a time for her to not only meet the parties, but also more importantly, Ashley, for her to try to push this case forward and get some momentum going on it. We had understood going into the hearing that that was her goal. And to that end, she did take a number of different steps to try to move this case forward and hopefully get some resolution in coming months one way or the other. Yeah, you know, we should probably take a step back and talk about this case and the charges. What is the crux of this case? So this all goes back more than a decade when Ken Paxton was still a resident of Collin County. And according to the allegations, there are three felony charges that he is facing. Two of them are state securities fraud charges. And what prosecutors allege is that he was seeking investors for a tech startup in the DFW area called Servergy, but in doing so did not disclose to those potential investors that he was getting paid by the company. There is also an allegation that he did not properly register as a securities advisor to the state securities board. Though one of the things that was clear from both the prosecutors and Paxson's attorneys is a lot of this is gonna hinge upon what happens during that Senate impeachment trial. So, Ashley, one of the things that was so striking to me is that even though this court hearing was really brief, we began to really get a complete picture of all of the weight that Ken Paxton is under, not only legally, criminally, but politically. And so things began sort of fitting together during this hearing. And to your point, one of the things that was discussed is whether or not Ken Paxton might be able or might be willing to resolve these state security felony charges against him after the impeachment is over. And his attorney, frankly, in a striking way, floated that possibility that Ken Paxton might be willing, particularly if he is found guilty during the impeachment trial, and removed from office, that he might be willing to try to establish some sort of agreement with those special appointed prosecutors to resolve this case. We tried to get more specific. Does that mean he would plead guilty, maybe plead guilty to a misdemeanor, maybe try to settle the case in some way? His attorney didn't go that far, but definitely opened the door to some sort of resolution of this case that did not, would not involve going to trial. On the flip side of this, Tony, do you think that there has not been an urgency to resolve this, at least from Paxton and his team, because he is an elected official right now? And so why, what's the rush? Well, as we know, this case, again, it's plotted along for eight years. There are all sorts of reasons for that, but including this argument over jurisdiction and venue and where the case would be heard. But and paying attorneys. And paying attorneys, <laughs> exactly. But I don't, I don't think Ken Paxton, while he has invoked his right to a speedy trial, I also don't see him out there demanding uh, that this case get resolved and that a trial get, get set. Yeah, because I think when we look at what happens with voters, they are unbothered by the fact that he is indicted. In fact, they've continued to elect him in spite of these indictments. And I've talked to political science experts over the past week who say that Ken Paxton has essentially established himself with Teflon status at this point, that no matter what happens in a Houston courtroom concerning these state security charges, no matter what other allegations are against him, he is still singing from the ideology handbook that they have given him to play from. And in their minds, particularly those primary voters, as long as he is living up to that 
in their minds, he will maintain that Teflon status. But Ashley, at the end of the day, we know there's a very different uh, standard when it comes to politics versus the court of law and the facts that these special prosecutors say they have and are willing to put on full display to a jury concerning Ken Paxton and those state security uh, fraud charges. You can learn more about Paxton and see a timeline of his indictment and proceedings at kview.com. That's Texas This Week.